And welcome back to the Financially Simple Podcast. I'm your host, Justin Goodbread, and today I'm joined by my dear friend and colleague, Mr. Chris Stewart. How are you, brother? I'm doing great. I'm up here in my happy place in northern Michigan. You know, I was just noticing the yellow, I guess they call it coffered ceiling. Is that what they call those? Or No, that's just, uh, just painted wood. Painted wood. <laughs> I've noticed the yellow <laughs> ceiling behind you. So you're in, are you in upstate Michigan? Is that right? Uh, well, that's, uh, that, that's a New York term. And we're in northern Michigan, or if they call it here, up north. Up north. You know what we say down here in the south is you're near Canada. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we give we give our friends up there in the north. We have some clients near the Minnesota Canadian border, and I always refer to them as they're they're, they're our Canadians. They're near Canada, and they just yeah. shake their head and say, "Justin, you need help." <laughs> so we're going to deal with a pretty uh, a pretty interesting topic today, Chris. One that um that you know me well enough by now that this has been near and dear to my heart since I founded the company way back in two thousand nine. Um, we're going to deal with factor based investing, more importantly, the three factor model. And yeah. whenever we look at three factor model, man, we can get, we can get awful deep into the weeds really fast. Can't we? It's amazing. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. So the idea behind three factor modeling is it's a strategy. It's a strategy that helps us. Well, as I say during feast or famine, you know, whenever times in the markets are really crazy and people are making lots of money, we need to have a strategy. And whenever times are very scary and people are losing theoretically lots of money on paper, we definitely need to have a strategy. And so the three factor model, Chris, I was introduced to this thing, man, it's, I'm talking about before I ever entered into the financial world, I was dealing with three factor modeling just in some research and came across a, a ton of Nobel laureates who had done the research over time and they did some interesting reports that not many people care to read that but you and I kind of a little bit nerds can like to read this type of stuff yep. but ultimately at the end of this particular episode we want to answer the age-old question what is good investing what is good yeah. investing that's what we're trying to drive for so I think the way we need to peel this onion back to answer that that question, what is good investing? We need to identify the term three factor model. So let's start off with what is a factor in that term three factor model? Yeah. So a factor is a characteristic, usually a fundamental characteristic of a stock that is persistent through a period of time. So the easiest one to explain is um, you know, the market has really large companies, Google, Facebook, Amazon, et cetera, and really small companies. Um, and the small companies are what we call small cap. And cap is just short for market capitalization. And the real big ones are large cap stocks. So small cap is a factor. It's something you can easily measure in terms of the capitalization is just simply the number of shares outstanding versus uh, times what the market is paying for those shares. Okay. So if we understand factor is basically a measurement, a yield tool of measurement, it's a fundamental type of analysis. I hear, I hear the doggy in the background. There. Oh yeah. Yeah. It's a, it's a term of more fundamental analysis versus a technical style of analysis. Is that fair to say? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, sometimes a factor is like momentum based on how a stock moves, but most of the time they're based on a characteristic of the company. Okay. So you use the term market cap. What does market cap mean? Yep. So capitalization is just a fancy term for uh, what the total shares of a stock are worth in the market based on that day's closing price. So Google, Amazon, billions and billions in terms of market cap um, and smaller stocks, certainly a lot less. So the way I describe it is, is, is um, Amazon, Google, those two names compared to caribou coffee. I was having coffee this morning, Chris, and I had this bag of fresh roasted caribou coffee. Let me tell you, it's one of my favorites. It's yeah. really good. It's really good. Um, we, we have lots of coffee all over the place. And, and that's just an example of, you know, uh, Google and Amazon is probably not going to go as go into bankruptcy potentially or go or be insolvent as fast as perhaps a caribou could because of the sheer cap or the size of the company. Is that a fair, easy example to use? Absolutely. Although large caps also <laughs> uh, can go down too. We have a, a rogues gallery of Enron, WorldCom, you know, other companies. 
Absolutely. Absolutely. So, you know, whenever I first uh, studied into the three factor model, I came across terms like or names like Harry Markowitz. And I know he was back in the 1960s, but he actually used this this term called a capital asset pricing model. What does that mean? Capital yep. asset pricing model. So the capital asset pricing model grew out of Markowitz's mean, uh, sorry, modern portfolio theory. And so people like Bill Sharp and uh, Trainer took that diversification that, that those teachings from Markowitz and they created a model and really cut up risk in the market into different factors. And it starts with the risk-free rate, which is really a US treasury bond, what you can earn with no credit risk. Um, you know, there's a little bit of uh, risk due to changes in interest rates, but you can buy that bond and hold it to maturity and earn that interest rate. So then the second part is the market premium. Well, what would you expect to earn in the market to get you get your money out of the mattress, get your money out of those uh, treasury bonds? And so that is above the risk-free rate. And then, so that's the broad market, but now you're gonna invest, invest in Caribou Coffee. So that is Caribou Coffee going to be more volatile than the market? You can call the market the S&P if you want, or less volatile. If you think it's going to move uh, more than the underlying market, you probably want to have uh, excess return. It's going to have a higher beta. Beta is just that it's going to be moving more than the overall market. And you want to be compensated for that risk because it may go up, but it also may go down more than the market. So theoretically, Chris, any investor out there has cash or some asset, some, some um, currency of, of whatever it is on a, on a global basis, let's use US dollar as our cash position. We could throw our money into US treasuries right now, which is like 0% return. It's not negative like some countries as we talk today, yes. but you know, it, it's, it's, we're getting some sort of a small return. Um, that would be the risk-free rate. And risk-free, we use the treasury because out of all the things out there, it has the full taxing power of the federal government. Not only that, but it also, um, other countries view our currency as one as the, as the most stable in the, in the globe, on the globe at this point. So we could take our dollars and buy the U.S. Treasury. That's okay. That's good. But, you know, if I'm going to do that, I might as well stick it in the market and underneath the mattress, as you said. The other side, though, is if I if I buy something, I want to see what a market premium that you, I think you said it was the market return minus the risk free rate. That's the premium. So right. if I'm trying to make a, if I need for my retirement to make a 10 percent return, that's an aggressive return today in today's economy. But let's say I wanted to try to make a 10 percent return. Then and today was at a zero rate on the Treasury. That means my market premium would be 10 percent. But then now let's say I want to buy caribou coffee, just as an example. By the way, friends, these, this is not a recommendation to buy caribou coffee. We're just using this as illustrated purpose only, okay? But let's say I did want to buy caribou coffee, which I really love their coffee, okay? That means I would then analyze the beta of that particular position, or in other words, the volatility, how fast it moves up, up or down in comparison to the market itself. And if it had, if I heard you right, if it had a higher beta, which is a one point plus, then it should yeah. move. It should, it should have more upside than the actual market. But if it had a low beta, which is a measurement turn compared to the market, I might not want to invest in that particular position using this very simple scenario that we're talking about. Does that sound about right? That sounds exactly right. You got to remember that that beta, that volatility cuts both ways because you are expecting to outperform as the market goes up, but if you do have a downturn, you think it'll go down significantly more. You can't have your cake and eat it too, right? You can't be in conservative stocks <laughs> and expect to outperform the market. So if we fast forward from the 1960s until the 1990s, we had these two individuals that appear on the, sh on the, on the scene. I wouldn't say they appear at that point. They started using yeah. computers and technology to start doing a little bit more computations. And that was Fama and French. And they yeah. found what in the early 1990s? So uh, they were looking at, well, one thing is that the University of Chicago, where both, both were, um, they had created a database of stock prices that goes back to 1927. 
This is the Center for Research into Stock Prices, CRSP or CRISP. Whenever you see something that has that time frame goes back to 27, you know it's using that broad data set. So, you know, you're a recent PhD. You're sitting there and say, hey, we got some computing power that's coming up and we got now this great database of stock prices. Let's decompose it. So they ran a, a bunch of statistical analyses and they found that there are pretty pers persistent excess returns, returns above the market to both small cap stocks and what they call value stocks, which really is a way of talking about unloved stocks, stocks that are selling more cheaply. So let's, let's dissect that actual statement. The research shows that there is more potential for outperformance of the market, more alpha is the term that we would use yep. in, in small cap and value. So let's talk, what is a small cap stock? Yep. So again, small cap are those companies that um, have a market capitalization that's relatively low. Almost all companies, except for Google, Facebook, start out as small cap. Remember, Microsoft started out in a garage, as did Hewlett Packard, et cetera, you know, and these companies became uh, mega companies. So it's just those that, again, uh, with the, the price and the shares outstanding, multiply gives you the market cap, and it tends. Um, Caribou Coffee is a small cap. Starbucks is a large cap. Yep. So when we look at small caps, I think the way one of the ways I often describe it is caribou coffee versus Starbucks. You know, a larger company is not going to be able to get as much growth or much bandwidth, relatively speaking. They're having to look at uh, various business strategies in order, to, in order to even keep their current growth patterns in place. Whereas a small company, I mean, I can even run to the Ansoff matrix, so the matrix that we use in the business modeling side that shows, you know, they could introduce one new line of one more service or product. And all of a sudden that product or service, a new introduction could take and drive a 15, 20, 30, 40% growth trend in one year's time. That's the, that's the beauty of a small company. And in fact, right. uh, you know, we, our listener base here on the financial system podcast, most of us are micro companies, micro cap companies. I mean, we're not in that $300 million of, of, of revenue, annual revenue to even kind of classify for a small cap. So we would be the micros. Right. I was doing a study the other day where we were writing some content for the idle and the, and the PPP loans. And um, I was, Marco Rubio said there's 30 million business owners in the United States. Well, if you actually delineate that down or decompose it using your term, bring that number down, it actually drops down to about 4.7 million firms or businesses will actually employ people. So yeah. you've got a ton of people here in the United States, a ton of businesses with the overwhelming majority being small in nature. And right. even though Facebook and, and Google didn't start at, at small, they were not traded at small. They were still small companies whenever, whenever um, they were founded and they, were, they stood in that small to mid and ultimately grew before they ever went to a public offering. Am I correct on that? Absolutely. So let's talk about value then. Small are those companies which we all can relate to, uh, uh, relate, if I could speak correct, correct today, we can all relate to that small company, but man, Chris, value, value's like the, uh, as I told somebody the other day, it's like the redheaded stepchild. No one wants to talk about value these days because really for the last 10 years, value has sucked. But what is yeah. value investing and why should we even consider this? So value investing, again, is those unloved companies. You're going to the used car lot to buy a used car and you see a you know, a beautiful uh, Cadillac or a, for, you know, Porsche and you, oh, it's beautiful. It's gorgeous. Got great paint. And next door is a, you know, a 20, you know, 15 year old car. It's got a few dings in it. It's not got, you know, polished uh, waxed finish, but it's half the price. Now, if you just want transportation to get from point A to point B, what's better value for your money? And which one is gonna hold its value over time? It's the beater, it's the dinged up car, right? Yeah. If you want, you can put some elbow grease in it and make it look pretty good and it'll, it'll actually appreciate in value. That's kind of the difference is, um, you know, the stocks that everyone tries to 
get into because they're popular. It's the next thing. It's the hot, hot stock. Unless you're a real early adopter, uh, you're less likely to make money because you've already bought as it's getting closer and closer to that peak. Whereas the, the value stock uh, is unloved for one reason or another. But remember, a lot of the returns historically in stocks have come from dividends rather than capital appreciation. So you don't have to pick something that's going to double in price over five or 10 years to do well in the market. So when we talk about the factors, we look at, you know, we look at beta, we look at um, the risk-free rate, we look at market premium, we, we kind of analyze that family French brought up in the 1990s talking now about value and small caps have a little bit more premium involved in them than others would. But Chris, I, I guess the question is, I mean, we're talking about 1990s and 1960s. Does three-factor modeling actually consist or persist through the time frame? I mean, here we are in 2020, is three-factor modeling still relevant today? Yeah, um, I think so. And the reason is really human nature. We talked about that bright, shiny object syndrome. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and um, what is the quote? I, I love the quote by Bill Gates. said, people overestimate the amount of change that will happen in two years and underestimate the amount of change that will happen in 10 years. So mm -hmm. we like to think that things continue pretty much the same way they have. So if you've held a stock, it's gone up 50, 70, 80%, you love that stock. You're holding on to it. This is going to be the next thing. It's going to continue to do the 50% a year for, for the next 10 years. Well, we used to say in the tech bubble, trees don't grow to the sky. You know, if it's done well for you, that's great. Um, but you're probably at that point better off going into something that's a little more unloved, that maybe has lagged behind, um, that is likely to, um, uh, to perform well over the long term rather than be a, a shooting star that goes up and burns out. You know, we often use the term chase the dragon in the, uh, mm. in the finance world. Yeah, I saw it a lot during over the last five years in the S&P 500. We talked about that last time you and I did a podcast together. Um, we talked about the S&P 500, but I, I watched people chase that dragon, you know, but it's not new. We, you and I were talking pre-show talking about the, the tulip bubble of the night of the 1640s, late thirties, right. early forties. And, and you just now mentioned the tech bubble. And then I, I remember the real estate bubble, right. Of the early two thousands. And here we are now, some would argue with the coronavirus bubble, right? I mean, who knows? Right. I mean, who knows what all this would be, but ultimately at the end of the day, we are looking at three particular factors that we could boil them down for illustrative purposes to, Buying things which have a more favorable upside and that it has the premium involved in it. And so we looked at the small cap and we looked at the value, but Chris, there's also this term called instead of the three factor model is also this five factor model and they introduce profitability into this, right? So we know in the three factor model, once again, that we're looking at the risk free rate, we're looking at the market premium and we're looking at beta. All right, those three things which we've already talked about. But then they, some people study the five-factor model, which brings in profitability and investment. What is it meant by profitability? So profitability is, is primarily a um, uh, earnings growth model. If you are out earning uh, the market, you should be rewarded for that. And I forgot who said that in the near term, the market is a voting mechanism. You're voting for the stock you think is going to do well. In the long term, it's a weighing mechanism. What it weighs is earnings. So if you have outperformed, out-earned the market, yeah, it may not be this year, it may not be next year, but you're going to uh, reap that in terms of your stock price. And then investment, that's the fifth, that's the fifth um, numerator, numerator in the five market model. Yeah. Uh, five factor model. What does investment mean? Investment is, are you aggressively investing? And if you are, that's usually for future growth, which often means that your near term growth is not so good. We had a funny rule of thumb. If any company built a new world headquarters, sell the stock. <laughs> if you're building for future growth and investing and taking money away from dividends or other things, it's very hard to grow the company, uh, grow the revenue of the company 
while you're investing heavily. So it's really conservative versus aggressive investment. You know, we often see that in the small business world. I mean, you, we've seen it in our own business here, and we often see in the small businesses that if we're lo- dealing with this term called a lifestyle business, which is where the business right. owner has des- designed the business to provide a high income, oftentimes they're not deploying that investment capital back into their business. So, so they have a high income or high dividend, so to speak, the, in, in, right. in investment terms. However, if someone is now going to try to redeploy that income back into the company with the idea of to raising the, the share price or raising the revenue of the firm, right, over the next four, five, six, seven, ten 10 year period of time, then as we've seen, it was as we were analyzing even in our own business, that the shareholders often don't receive as much dividend because they're deploying that, 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 that dollars back. So that's an illustration, friends, that you might recognize in your own world as as you're trying to grow your own company at this particular point. So Chris, I guess the three factoring model, I mean, we, we, we dealt with a lot of technical terms today. We dealt with this idea of what is a factor? What is market cap? What is the capital asset pricing model? We introduced some names like Fama and French. I even heard you put trainer and sharp in there. We will have to one day deal with the trainer and sharp ratios. We quoted Bill Gates because you got to throw a Bill Gates quote in here once in a while. We stayed away from Warren Buffett today. We had nothing against the fellow. We just, today was not his day, but ultimately at the end of the day, as we began with the beginning of this conversation, the three factor model or the five factor models we introduce here later in the, in the show is ultimately to answer this one question. What is good investing? So Chris, what is good investing? Well, uh, I'm going to use someone else here, Cliff Asnes, who is a, a big name in the industry, AQR. Um, I was reading a piece on his about is value dead where he dissected it 12 ways to Sunday. And in his conclusion, I think he said it really well. Good investing isn't about sure things and certainly rarely about precise timing. Sure things are usually about cheating. (laughs) That's a good way to end up in jail. And if not, it's almost always arbitraged away very quickly. Good investing is about being on the right side of the odds and sticking with good strategies. So when we build a portfolio, yeah, so let me, let me say it in, in my vernacular, friends, in the, in the financially simple terms. When we build an investment, whether it's our securities investment, our real estate investment, or even if you have multiple businesses, you're trying to increase your odds for your success. Chris and I and several of the other colleagues on the, in the companies, we've been producing these joint podcasts here this year. We all brought it back to this point that you have to have a written financial plan. You have to know what your premium dollars, are, that your investment premium, what you're trying to yield on your particular portfolio, whether that's securities or real estate or your business, what is the yield that you're trying to receive in order to re- for you to reach your goals? And I think Cliff here, Cliff Asnes, as Chris just read about, show that it's about being on the right side of the odds. In order to do that, you, there's, a lot of, there's a lot of technical analysis research provided by laureates, Nobel laureates over the years, which, which help us in this idea. But more importantly, I think the most important thing he said, if I, if I can read this back, is, is good investing is about being on the right side of the odds and sticking with good strategies. Chris, man. How many times have we had people who like the odds, but then whenever turbulence comes their way, we often abandon good strategies. I mean, you're Absolutely. a pilot. What would you do if, if you all of a sudden felt some turbulence, literally, figuratively, not, not figuratively, literally in your airplane? I mean, hopefully you're going to stay by the rule book and all the, and all the principles you had learned to get through the plane to the ground safely. Yeah. It's, but it's always tempting to say, ah, I can save a half hour by just going, there's a little gap in these clouds. They look really dark and dangerous. I, I don't need to go around. No, it's, uh, it's it, in investing that turbulence can be attracted to that bright, shiny objects like, no, I'm gonna, I, I know it's different this time. Again, those are the most dangerous words in the English language. It's different this time. I'm gonna go for that bright, shiny object and I'm gonna, really goose my returns because I only got a couple years to retirement. I got to do it. It's better to create the plan, stick to the plan. Absolutely. Absolutely. So friends, we have been dealing with a three factor model. And for more information on this type of, of this type of subjects, Chris is going to be talking with us more about some other things. In fact, next time we're going to be dealing with modern portfolio theory. Check out the blog, Financially Simple. Check out the YouTube channel. 
look, friends, I realize life is hard. I get it. We all have shiny object syndrome. If you say you don't, you're lying because we all do. We all have shiny object syndrome, even our businesses and our car purchases. Even when we go out to eat, we all we have shiny object syndrome. We don't need it in our investing. Investing is the opposite of the way we've been trained to think. It's often, as Warren Buffett said, it should be slothful, bordering a sense of lethargic in nature. So friends from Chris and I and the entire team here at the Financially Simple Heritage Investors, look, we realize life is hard, life is frustrating, but life is good. Life is good. We're going to continue to make our lives at least financially simple. Y'all go out and make it a great day.